Kia ora, hello and welcome to The Breakdown. Yes, we've seen just about three weeks we've been locked down, but we have been busy. We've been looking through, talking to people around the world to keep you updated on what's happening in the global game of rugby union. Mills Muli Aina, Bernadine Oliver Kirby joins us and Sir John Kerwin. JK, as always, plenty to happen, but still, once again, first and foremost, how are you coping? How are we on top of things? And bottom line, is your Zoom getting a hammering? Yeah, Zoom's getting a complete hammering. I've had a uh, pretty good week, actually. I've been sticking to a routine, which is uh, part of what you should be doing, and that's really helping. Uh, doing some physical stuff. I've uh, got some spies down at Waihi, and I heard Mills is actually out running, which could be interesting for him to chat about. But uh, had a fantastic Easter, actually. We, we celebrated like Italians do, so we had a, uh, a very long lunch. We had two starters. Um, and a main, and two desserts, and coffee and grappa. So it's usually you have day. a second main. You usually have a second main. What happened to your second main? It usually comes in somewhere. No? Yeah, I just felt I was eating a bit too much lately, Goldie, so we put it down to eight courses instead, <laughs> oh, instead nice. of nine. <laughs> and eight, eight different varieties of alcohol. For you, Mills, how are you tracking, mate? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And as you said, you know, JK, I have been out for a little bit of a run, you know, it's sort of uh, you just you know, keep keep on trucking. But the, I think the, the best thing about that is, uh, you know, you get a bit of fresh air, you come back. The unfortunate part is I, I started, my hamstring started pulling up. So I was a little bit uh, sceptical about that. But the Easter Bunny, he turned up uh, yesterday. And uh, unfortunately, all that all that running went out the window. So uh, I'm, I'm going all right. But so I need to get back out there. And start sort of hit the roads again. Talking of running, no one runs more than uh, Bernie in this group. <laughs> Bernie, um, you went for, you went for a run after last week's show. You sent me a, a little photo just as you're about to go for another gallop. How are you tracking? And I'll tell you what, how are you keeping up with what's going on around the rugby world? Oh, it is it is full on, isn't it? Like you guys, I'm just trying to count down the days and get some fresh air and exercise. And yeah, nice one about the hammy mills. It was bound to come out, wasn't it? I don't believe him. Um, interesting times with rugby. So many different things are going on, despite no live rugby. Grant Fox has basically come out saying, this is our summer break. This is our downtime now. And he's not wrong. Um, he reckons it could be about 18 months before we see any routine or semblance of rugby as we knew it. Doesn't mean we won't get any, but it's going to probably take that long to get into some kind of pattern. What has been touted, and I love this idea, in fact, I don't know anyone who doesn't think it's a good idea, is the old North versus South. And, and I know, apart from you, Mills, I think you've all played it. JK, are you keen for this kind of competition? Uh, bring it back. I loved North-South. It was our state of origin back in the day. And the interesting thing back then was you're playing alongside someone, you know, in my day for Auckland, and you didn't realise he was born down south. And then you got to go and play against him. So it really was mate against mate, you know, which is fantastic. But the other thing that used to be happening nowadays was an all-black trial. So it had a lot going um, on the game, and I loved it. Bring it back. It'll Bernie, be great. I played, Foxy I played in one, Bernie. I played in one. And it meant I had to play against Jonah. So I wasn't a massive fan <laughs> of the North-South game. So I tell you what, I think it's a great concept. I'd like to see it again. And the thing is, it's it's not only, you know, it could be where you were born, maybe where you went to school. The rules aren't hard and fast, but um, Mills, who would you represent? Because you're born down south, but you're, you're a North Island boy when it comes to your playing time. Well, I don't, I don't realise it was from where you were born. I actually just thought it was based on... Um, where you're actually played. So, I mean, that, to that, I mean, how great is that? How great is that to actually know how that sort of... No, Millsy, no. No, Millsy, no. Yes, Millsy. No, that's exactly <laughs> well, the whole idea. Like, the problem... You gotta, the, Bernie, the you're problem. wrong. You've got to have the rules clear. Exactly. <laughs> where you play the first club rules. game or where it's your born. Oh, you can't say, is. Bernie, you can't say, oh, nah. <laughs> it's actually that I'm much not saying, oh, nah. where you were born. We We've got some time to work out those rules anyway, I think. Um, now, JK, last week you called for um, former players to come and support the rugby union, the Australian rugby union. We know Railing Castle's been under so much scrutiny. Well, Tim Horan, former Wallaby, two-time World Cup winner, has come out not only with some good ideas, it's actually a five-point plan. So he's done his homework. They're not all new. He's basically saying that the Rugby Union and the Rugby Union Players Association, they need to come to some sort of agreement with the pay dispute. It's been going on and on. They haven't agreed to anything hard and fast. 
that needs to be settled first and foremost. Secondly, he thinks that the rugby union in Australia should get a loan from the government. And this isn't silly, is it? Because it means basically they can try and trade their way out of it. Whether that's going to happen or not, we don't know. Number three, a domestic competition. It's what we're talking about here as well. A domestic competition in Australia, but also including the unwanted Sunwolves and the Western Force. Number four on his list, let's get those broadcast deals up and going. We need a broadcast partner. You need to reopen the negotiations and get talking and firm something up. That is an absolute given. I reckon that's top of the list. Also, um, looking at the Asian market, number five, and maybe that's where the Australian Union, he thinks, should be getting their ties with. It's a better time zone. It's very lucrative. Financially, it's a big plus. So there you go, Timmy Horan. He's the man at the moment. Yeah, look, and I think, con congratulations, Tim. I think it's fantastic. I don't necessarily agree with all your ideas, um, but, but having ideas means that we can have conversation. And I think, Mills, the most important thing for the Australian game at the moment, even for the players negotiating, you've got to leave your egos at the door. This is not about us. This is not about, you know, the the ex-players. This is actually about the future of the game. So, you know, Tim's coming out with some ideas and you shouldn't sort of poo-hoo them. We've got to be discussed, Mills. Yeah, and, and what a difference a week makes, you know. I mean, you think of last week and they're putting all the, the pressure on Raylene Castle and... Uh, you know, putting her head on the chopping board and she's got to, you know, get going. And all of a sudden you come up with some constructive sort of, you know, feedback, five points, pretty good. You know, I, I like that the domestic game it has been relatively pretty pretty strong in terms of the following. So, and there's things that they have to get settled. You know, obviously the broadcasting um, scenario and also the, the players dis dispute with the, uh, with the RA. But the biggest thing for me is that his, his thought process and the thinking, well, we've got to go venture out uh, to the Asian market, obviously, because, you know, that's where they're, they're perhaps going to get some revenue. So it's great stuff. Now former players over there are starting to get on board because as we've seen here in New Zealand, and as we'll probably talk to a, few, a bit later on with the Players Association, it's the fact we're all in this together and we've got to find a way to come together and plan something out so that, uh, you know, that, that, that this game of ours, you know, is back where it was when we, um, when we left it. Money is one of the big talking points for Sir Ian McGeekin. He has done a, an opinion piece, a good opinion piece in the Daily Telegraph, basically saying um, a lot needs to change on that front. He, he refers to rugby as the land grab of the 90s, where it was all great when it turned professional, yet everyone was getting their little bit and their little piece of the pie, and there's been no global continuity. So he makes a good point there. He's also raising the ideas of trimming squads, paying players less, also agents getting a, a lower cut, um, fewer games. It's really coming down to the bottom line of money. Yeah, I think that's one of the big conversations everyone's talking about is the fact that how do you regenerate the income? How do you start again? And where is that money going to come from? And whether or not private equity is going to play a bigger part in the game going forward? Look, Ian McGeckin is one of the uh, one of the great coaches in the game. He's one of the great minds in the game. He's been around a long time and has seen huge transition. Uh, but it's one of those things, though. You've got to get the balance right at looking at the values that happened 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago and combine that with what is the marketplace right now. And yeah, we've, got to get those, we've got to get those things right and get the balance right. And those are not easy. Uh, and I and understand that uh, there are so many challenges, but there are so many opportunities. Everyone keeps talking about the opportunity. It's up to these people who are, uh, who are in uh, positions of responsibility to be able to go out and deliver something that's going to, I suppose, answer the call for everyone, not just a few. And going yeah, global. I, I think, I think Sorry, Jay, Reed's hey? a, yeah, I think, I think um, when you talk about finances and, and Syrian, amazing man. And I think like Mills and I spoke about before with Tim Horan coming out with, with some ideas, it's important to put these things down and then have an open, honest discussion, agree to disagree. And that's how we'll move forward as a, as a team. I think, you know, when you talk about how the financial pie is cut up, if it gets out of kilter, then the game's not going to be able to survive. You know, people often quote to me, well, what about the NBA? Well, the NBA, the players take 49% of the revenue, but the owners are still making, you know, 5, 10, 15, 30. It's still profitable. And I think coming out of COVID, what we've got to look at at our game is, is it sustainable? Are the percentages of the owner getting the money, the, the players getting the money, 
the game getting the money. And the other thing that's really interesting, we also have to support an amateur game. You need to keep that into context. So hopefully through this, it will be about money, Bernie. It is about money, but it's how that's distributed properly. And there'll have to and be some sacrifice, won't there? There'll have to be some sacrifice. And finally, Bernie, some astonishing news really coming out of Australia. Yeah, uh, Rob Penny, the head coach of the Waratahs, New South Wales Waratahs, is it fair for me to say he's basically been axed? He's been stood down with no pay, yet his two assistant coaches have been retained. And that is what smells a little funny about this whole setup. Um, we know that it's tough times. 70% of New South Wales Waratahs staff have been um, axed, stood down without pay. Um, the chairman, he has taken a 30% cut, as most have. So they are trying to trim where they can. They have reiterated, this is not performance-based, but you've got to wonder why you would let your head coach go, your kingpin, in a time like this when you're retaining other staff. So I don't know, is that a good look? Is it desperate times? Uh, it's certainly probably something that Rob Kenny didn't foresee, despite it being uh, not a great season for the, what people are calling it, the Horatars. Well, of course, there's so much going on in the game at the moment here in New Zealand, closer to home. Look, of course, there's so much conversation between the players, uh, the organisations, the unions, the franchises. We're lucky enough to have two of those people on the show uh, today, and that's Rob Nickel from the... He's the boss of the New Zealand Rugby Players Association and one of the representatives, of course, All Black Sam Kane from the region of the Chiefs and, of course, being part of World Cup campaigns and everything. And Lads, thanks so much for joining us. Rob, first and foremost, though, this lockdown, it's been close to nearly three weeks. How have you coping? You told me beforehand you've got a little bit of property you've been able to get some training in, but uh, how have you dealt with the challenges of being at home for, for three weeks? Yeah, well, it's actually been quite good being busy, you know, and having a routine and getting stuck into things and um, just been grateful, I guess, Goldie. Like, you know, we know it's a unique situation. We're, we're pretty fortunate as a family. We're together. We're happy. You know, it's all going pretty well. We know a lot of people are struggling, so... Yeah, being grateful and, and just structuring your days and giving a bit of sense of purpose. And, mate, we, we're getting through it. And, yeah, no complaints whatsoever. Winter. Sam, for you, the, the purpose for you, I suppose, is to try and keep in shape. How's that going? And bottom line, if you're doing it by yourself, how tough is it to motivate yourself to continue to drive and keep yourself in top nick? Yeah, g'day, Goldie. Uh, just prior to lockdown, I was talking to Lachlan Boshier on the phone. And I said, where, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? And he said, oh... I'm not sure, you know, be talk about bunkering up with someone. So I got off the phone and rang my wife, Harriet. I was like, what do you reckon about uh, Lockie <laughs> and his partner moving in with us? You know, it'd be quite good to have a few extra people around. And she's like, yeah, that'd be a great idea. So straight back on the blower to Lockie. Um, so he's moved in with his partner, Bex. And then Harriet's younger brother, Liam, who's um, down in, in Christchurch, 20-year-old um, tw up um, inspiring rugby player he's he just managed to get a flight up to the north island in time so there's five of us in the household uh, and three of us who are you know training for rugby so that certainly helped with motivation been hammering the roads a wee bit which has been a bit hard on the legs not used to running on the roads but um, we're doing our best to stay in shape and and keep routine like Rob talked about Awesome. Well, I've got to ask you, first and foremost, look, um, reality is there's a lot of information floating uh, uh, mm. around in terms of the conversations you're have, having with New Zealand rugby. I mean, how accurate are those? And can you give us an update of where those conversations are at right now? Yeah, look, um, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure what's floating around. But, um, but in terms of where we're at with New Zealand rugby, it's been we're in together, uh, very much so with the clubs, the provinces and all the people. Uh, yeah, from players' perspective, right away, we we're provided with a lot of information, all the financials, all the medical stuff. Uh, and we've, I think it would be fair to say we feel like we've been you know, really in, in the mix with it all, which is great. Um, so good relationship-wise, good in, that we're in it together. And, um, and also really cognizant that you know, some really big and tough calls are having to be made by New Zealand rugby and the clubs and the provinces and, and, the, and the rugby clubs around the country, you know, the impact on community funding impact on the professional game it, it's significant and it's having an effect on businesses associated with everyone so probably the, the big one early on was just we got a bit of a, a, a head start I suppose in seeing the kind of impact this was going to have and we're just feeling for a lot of those people and from a player's perspective we, we know we've got to step up we've seen Bodie and Dane come out and, and acknowledge that we've, we've got to step up and do all we can for the game and to put us on a footing where we can survive a worst case scenario and so we've been working up a remuneration strategy to 
to deliver that. So, you know, worst case scenario in our mind and, and New Zealand rugby's mind is no rugby this year. What do the financials look like? What do we have to do from a player's perspective to play our part in getting through that? And then if we uh, if we work really hard with them to be ready to go, um, you know, should the opportunity emerge, then, then that's that's the key. And then then if we do get a chance to get on the field, making sure we deliver then. And that's that's been our, our approach. Um, we're getting down to the detail. Hopefully later this week we might be able to come out and explain to everyone what we're doing. But we know we've got to play our part and, and the boys are going to, and, and the girls are going to step up big time. Rob, I know it's difficult, a difficult time for all of us, and we're working together, and I think that's fantastic. Across the Tasman, you're, you're here seeing Raylene and the players not reaching agreement. They're talking about 65%. You go Northern Hemisphere, they're talking figures all the time. But, I mean, is, is, a, flat, is a flat sort of percentage a possibility, or do you have to look at, at, at different cases, probably like you would with the different sort of, you know, grades of payment? I mean, is it an across-the-board thing or something that you're trying to work out in different phases? Yeah, look, it's a good question, Joe. Okay. To be fair, it's um, you know we've got some principles we want to observe. So, in looking at the model that we've been discussing with the players in New Zealand rugby and the agents, uh, so we've got fourteen accredited agents who are all ready and available to provide players with support, and our personal development managers as well in the same boat. So they've got all the information. They're all part of the conversations because it's one thing to go in there and say, hey, listen. This is what remuneration might look like. It's another thing to make sure you've got the support to help people pull the levers and make the decisions they need to make now. But when, to, to answer your question, we look across the board. It's not about a straight percentage. No, it's not. It's, it's about saying, okay, this is what we want to try and target by the end of the year. And it's a pretty significant number, mate. And then, then we look at what payments are due between now and the end of the year. Um, you know, what, can we, what can we set aside? Uh, what, what do we have to pull back on? And, and what do we have to effectively freeze? And, it's a combination of saying, you know, team assembly fees. Well, we're not, you know, in the worst case scenario, if we're not playing, let's look at freezing those. And then we sort of go down the different benefits and payments and ultimately look at retainers as well. Um, we also have a principle of wanting to look after those that are perhaps at the lower end of the scale. So, you know, if you're thinking Black Ferns, Sevens, draft contract players, you know, players that aren't earning sort of more than that $50,000 kind of level, there's an obligation on the group to, to make sure they're taken care of and they don't, um, you know, hurt, hurt so much. And then we've obviously fortunate enough to have some, some good earners and, and those, uh, those guys and girls step up as well and recognise that they've probably got to shoulder a little bit more of the responsibility. So um, I have to say it's been a, an incredibly impressive process from the players' perspective. Um, real maturing, I think, generation. And I think that's what this COVID-19 is doing to the country, really. It's a real maturity of the generation and, and they've been great. Sam, let's talk about it from your perspective. You're going into a rugby season thinking you're going about playing rugby and then all of a sudden this challenge is being faced by not just us but so many sports and everyone across our country and across the globe. How hard has it been for you to, to, to put that aside and go, you know what, I've got to consider so many different things now and, and for you putting that hat on, how have you approached it? Uh, yeah, good question. To be honest, it hasn't been... Uh, too too tough. Um, you know, I've certainly realised that rugby is just a game, and it only takes. Uh, particularly, I've, I've found in the last ten days to two weeks, where you hear more and more about businesses struggling, about people getting laid off, and when you start to hear these things, it sort of it really hit home a lot more. And um, you know, I know there's people in the Chiefs who have had to. Uh, minimise the staff that are working, um, all these type of things, and then you realise our our roles uh, pretty small. But we just want to make sure we're doing everything we can to help sort of navigate through this time. Uh, one thing we can control as players is making sure we're staying in, in good shape, so that when the time comes to get back out on the field, we can put a good product out there. But um, we realise that a lot of people are hurting during this time. Um, so, yeah, we, we just want to, I suppose, from a player's point of view, we want, to, we want to be able to look back when we get through this and think, yeah, we, we dealt with this um, in the best possible way in terms of New Zealand rugby, um, and we can just look back on it with, with pride that we did the right thing. How do you get the collective voice? Uh, how do you uh, talk to the other players across the country? Is, is, it, is that your responsibility, one of your responsibilities? And how do you, I suppose, gather their opinion about what they're dealing with and, and what, I suppose, they want to be a part of going forward? Yeah, so t 
technology has been outstanding in this space. Um, pretty much every team will have a WhatsApp group. So WhatsApp's been unreal. And then so is Zoom. So the work that uh, Rob and Kev Senior do with the Players Association is, is world class. We're, we're very lucky to have them. Um, and the communication that they go back and forth uh, between each Super Rugby team. So there's a couple of representatives from each Super Rugby team. Um, we'll communicate with our team, um, go back to Rob. And pretty much at the moment, once or twice a week, we jump on a Zoom conference like this with, I suppose, you'd say they're the leaders of each Super Rugby squad. Um, we nut out everything with Rob, uh, fire through any questions, uh, and then myself, uh, Sam Whitelock and Sarah Goss are also part of another group uh, who is prominently made up of CEOs and board members and, and Rob, so uh, we're mixing with some big dogs, but it's the idea behind that group is to look at uh, the best way to get through this time from a rugby point of view, um, commercially, and what, what a competition will look like depending on when the uh, levels get down to level one realistically is when we'll probably be able to play rugby. So lots of communication, but we've got plenty of time on our hands to make sure those communication lines are, are open. And um, yeah, it's been, like Rob said, I've been really impressed with uh, what, how collaborative everyone is from the players um, to New Zealand rugby. Everyone's working together to get the best outcome for rugby as a whole. Rob, I know that, um, you know, it's very, very important and uh, this collaboration and this is what I love, especially about um, our game is people are prepared to step up and make sacrifices. But where are we sitting internationally? I know we've got to look after a little bit of our own uh, backyard first and our probably our, our brothers across the Tasman are struggling a wee bit. But, you know, are you also talking internationally as a players group to say how can we collectively come out of this? Yeah, you know, like um, as Sam said, you know, we, we also each week we've kind of had the whole squad. So we'll get all the sevens women on a call. We'll get all the sevens men or the super rugby or the black ferns, the whole squad come on. And we'll update them, sure, around the financial outlook and stuff like that. But also, JK, exactly to your point, you know, we'll talk about where things might be heading, what's happening um, globally, particularly around the international rugby scene. You know, at the moment, a lot of conversations and willingness from World Rugby to, to look at solutions. Uh, so July is obviously looking unlikely. So you know, can we push July into October and, and then play November? And what would that look like? And will the clubs cooperate? So all those conversations are happening. Um, we have uh, weekly link-ups with the other player associations from around the, the rugby world. Uh, we have fortnightly link-ups with the World Players Association, which is, I think we've got about 85,000 athletes around the globe. So that's football, NBA, uh, NFL, all the American, North American sports, um, and then a lot out of Asia and, and Europe, you know, cycling, et cetera. So we're learning and sharing information um, around those kind of environments. And then we're also, um, we're really well supported from a medical standpoint as well. So we have a, a director on International Rugby Player Association and even linking in through the chief medical officers throughout rugby globally. Yeah, you know, we can go into them with any question at any time and they'll come back with a consensus answer. So it's, um, it's been quite impressive about how everyone's pulled together and shared information. Um, you know, you reference Australia and we've been talking to the Player Association, Justin Harrison, who's heading that up over there. And, you know, the, the, the benefits I guess we have here is we have a solid relationship. We're sharing information and we're able to get aligned and unified in terms of how we deal with the challenge. And that, that's the key because these times are tough. But I tell you what, they present opportunities as well. And if we can keep our eyes open and our heads up and work together in the best interests, if you like, of rugby and can you know, support the government and their strategy, play our role as part of New Zealand society and, and do all we can to beat this pandemic, the, the opportunities will come. And we just want to make sure, as Sam said, you know, in two years' time, we look back and think we were there, we played a role, and we took advantage of it, um, of the opportunities when they got there. I think globally, everyone's pretty keen to, to see Things, things go forward positively, but it's, it's tough times at the moment, for sure. You, you talk about opportunities, uh, Sam, in, in relation to uh, a lot of talk about change and resetting the game before this pandemic even came along. Uh, do you think now, um, from a player's perspective, there's certainly a greater awareness of the fact that maybe rugby does need a, a, a reset of, of some sort? And I know Rob's talked about it in two years' time, but do you believe in itself um, the product itself, the game itself, uh, is there to, to, to grow 
and to re-engage with its fans once again? Yeah, I do think so. I think um, hopefully we'll come out of this and realise how much we miss and love rugby, first and foremost. But from a player's point of view, we're absolutely really open-minded to new competitions um, and anything that can create that real buzz around rugby. The product itself, like the games, are outstanding. Um, but maybe if there's chances for to spruce things up and um, put a different twist on it. Uh, now, I know pr earlier in this, this year, uh, there was a lot of work going into trying to create a global comp. Uh, but like I said, from a player's point of view, we're really open to that. But we also realise the logistics of some of these things are pretty difficult. But um, yeah, like Rob said, this time of year, well, with this going on, uh, it does present opportunities to look at all these sort of things. And um, I've been impressed with the way that everyone is openly looking at them and, and pretty keen to do what's best. We've, um, Rob, guys, we've had, a, we've had a competition working group that Samuel Whitelock's heading up. So we've got 15 players on that, including guys that you know, might attend cup level and right the way through. And some of the ideas coming through around, okay, you know, might attend cup, a potential North versus South, you know, what role does Super Rugby have? All, all those conversations have been had and players are feeding, feeding that information and those ideas in and you can, you can sense the enthusiasm they have around it. So it, it is really interesting times in that respect. I think, um, Rob, if, if like Sam said, if, you, if we look back on this crisis, say in 12 months time, two questions, uh, you know, what would you like the public to think of how the players handled this firstly? And then secondly, what is, uh, November look like for you if we're out and the world's open to play football? Yeah, look, I think um, first and foremost, I, I don't think it's so much about what we're doing on the field from a player's perspective. I think I'd like New Zealand to, to think that the players really recognise the situation and play their role in supporting the government and everyone else in fighting this pandemic. Um, really show their appreciation of essential services, emergency workers, everyone that's actually doing it, doing it hard and doing it for us really at the moment. So that, that would be, you know, really, I think, a big one for us. Um, and certainly the players talk about it and appreciate that. I think uh, getting back on the field, JK, I think, you know, rugby and sport in general in New Zealand has a role to play. Um, I know the boys and the girls can't wait to play that role. They want to get out there and they want to bring a bit of inspiration, a bit of fun uh, back into things and, and play their role in, as New Zealand gets up and starts, starts cranking things out. Uh, come November, I think, you know, like, I think the most important thing I'm hearing from players is they do want the opportunity to play a domestic focus competition as soon as possible and, and use that to galvanise the country. So if we get to new to November and people are looking and thinking, gee, the players, they, they put a really good competition out on the field. It's something we love. They obviously love playing it. Coaches love being involved and we all got a lot out of it and really enjoyed it. I think they would the players would feel great about that. If there's an opportunity to play some international stuff, I think that'll be important as well because that, that takes it to another level. Um, commercially, that will be important as well. So I think that's where we'd like to be in November. And I think also um, maybe just, as Sam mentioned, you know, just a real appreciation for rugby and what it can do. And maybe you know, that momentum around a reset and what the future might look like is, is taken through to just some key, um, key decisions that start to emerge around that sort of December, January, February timeframe. So uh, that means to me, Sam, there are derbies coming your way, brother. They are derbies coming your way, whether it's super rugby, whether it's provincial stuff. That is going to be fun to watch because that's the sort of rugby you're talking about, right? The fact when you guys get to play against each other, you want to put your best foot forward. Is, is that something, and, and when you see that, and, and you know what super rugby, but even if you guys, if the All Blacks were back in a provincial championship, that would certainly uh, bring some motivation for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. That working groups um, looking at, you know, depending on what stage we can get back playing rugby, whether it's um, July, August, uh, the earlier it is, the more likely we are to have some super rugby hit outs, um, which is awesome because it hurts us to see um, the clubs that we love playing for hurting financially. So um, if we can get out and play some rugby and create some revenue that way, um, that would be awesome. And then yeah, imagine a domestic comp with all the All Blacks back in. It's been a, a while since that's been the case. So that would, um, I think that's something that the the public will really get behind. Our players are chatting pretty positively about that too. That's bad. Plenty North of South. North, North South. South. Where were oh. you born, Sam? You're a North Island. You're a Bay, Bay boy, aren't you? 
North Island, Bay, born and bred, mate. I'll be uh, ch- jumping in the blue Bring the and, south uh, back. Blue and yellow hoops. <laughs> Bring it down <laughs> south, then we'll see exactly how much you love about it. Let's oh, talk. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm with you, Jeff. You know. sure. Two games for sure. One in the north, one in the south. Yeah, maybe like yeah. a state of or- maybe like a state of Oregon set up. Oh, that Watch playoff! I like it. I like the sound of it. Hey, thanks, Rob. Hey, thanks, Sam. Thank you so much. Uh, keep up the great work. We're looking forward to maybe later on this week hearing how those negotiations are going. But uh, like you say, it seems as though everyone have certainly um, brought together, uh, come together, and are working towards uh, an outstanding result. So looking forward to seeing you guys, particularly you, Sam, back on the field. And Rob, keep up the great work. Thanks. Thanks, James. Appreciate the time. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Before the lockdown was in place, we had an opportunity to catch up with Jackson Garden Bishop, the Hurricanes player, and hear him talk about his mother, Sue, and the influence she had on him growing up to becoming the man he is today. What are you watching? With baby Marley around, Hurricanes first five Jackson Garden Bishop and partner Rosie are living the life lessons thrust on new parents. Don't tell me to smile for TV. Always wanted to be a dad. You have an idea of what it's going to be like and you, you go to classes, you read books, you read things online, but until you're in the trenches, like two in the morning, you sort of don't really understand what it's all about. And yeah, I'm just loving every minute of it, learning a lot. 25-year-old Jackson already knows a little too much about growing up quickly. He did it 11 years ago, when his mum Sue's brave battle with cancer ended. It was, it was tough. First couple of years, I sort of just, I put some headphones on and, and blocked everyone out. I was really angry at the world. Didn't try not to show it as much, but other than rugby, I was, I was um, not, not as social as I, as I am now. Some of the problems my friends were going through at that school, I just brushed that off and think, you're being an idiot, mate, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So I put a lot of things into perspective at quite a young age. Jackson wakes up to a cherished reminder of his mum each morning. My mum was an awesome lady, so driven, so passionate about everything she was doing. It's tough because my main memories of her were after she got sick. She got sick when I was about eight years old, and through that time she was still an absolute trooper. She she coached me pretty much all, all age grade rugby. Um, she was doing heaps of stuff with my brother and sister. Definitely didn't appreciate it as much how hard that would have been for her because she never batted an eye at it. Uh, all I saw was her giving us everything. And it wasn't just Jackson and siblings Georgia and Connor that Sue looked after. She was a pillar of North's rugby, coaching juniors at the famed Porirua club throughout her fight. A lot of talent out there, but there's a lot of kids that are in tough positions family-wise, so she had to be stern with them, but she also knew knew where they were coming from, so she was really helpful, always available to pick people up, um, give them most of training, you know, encouraging through prizes and stuff. She also helped kids outside of the area. Where's mummy, he asked. Dad took a deep breath as Georgia and Jackson came in and sat on the bed. She's not well, said Dad. Last night, the doctor told us Mummy had cancer and she has to stay in hospital for a while. Sue self-published a book. Who Will Tuck Me In helps kids through the challenges hers faced and remains one of the most popular at the Cancer Society. She snuggled up Connor in the blankets with his favourite teddy. She read him a story, then tucked him in and turned out the light. She must have been so tired, but, but she never showed it to us kids. Sue Garden Bashup's sporting achievements are also inspirational. She was an original black fern, as well as playing touch, hockey and basketball for New Zealand. She formed a sporting power couple with all-black husband Stephen and broke major barriers as a coach. Yeah, she was definitely a, a pioneer for women in rugby, I think. Obviously the first woman coach of a men's premier team over at North, so she was awesome and determined to make sure that something that she was passionate about. She loved playing rugby, that other women in her position would have the same opportunities and more opportunities, um, which they are getting now, which is cool. Do you think you'd be a pro rugby player if it wasn't for her? Oh, it's tough to say. The building blocks of my rugby were, were fundamentally from her. You know, Dad, Dad was always around. He's, he's a huge influence on my rugby, but in terms of the hands-on coaching in those junior grades, um, it, was, it was pretty much her, yeah. For you being coached by her, what was that like? You know, at the time, it's like, sometimes it's our oh, mum's coaching. It's, it's not cool to have your mum as the coach, but I'll give anything for her to be the coach now, so, yeah. And she could have been. Oh, she would have been, I've no doubt. Um, you know, if she, if she had stayed healthy, she would have been, if not running New Zealand rugby, I'd say at this point. She was, she was that type of person. I love you more than the stars, said Connor. And I love you more than ice cream, said mum. Connor giggled and shut his eyes. While Sue Garden Bashup's book ended, 
Her legacy lives on. It makes me sad that Marley will never get to meet her. You know, I, I appreciate like, the 13 years that she was around for me, the, the values that she was able to instill in me. I'm remembering a lot of them now, or, or they're coming forward um, now, and I'm, and I'm hoping to pass them on to, to my kids. She was special. Let's stay in the Southern Hemisphere. Let's go to Buenos Aires. Hola to a very good friend over there. Of course, the vice chairman of World Rugby as it stands right now and a legend of the game, a puma himself from way back. Halfback, of course, Augustine Pichel. Gus, how are you? We are in lockdown here in New Zealand. How are things for you in Argentina? Hello, guys. Uh, thank you for, for calling and checking out. Uh, things here are probably the same as, as with you. We're in lockdown. We've been for the last couple of weeks in the same situation that most of us have around the world. Nothing different. Rugby has closed down since uh, I think the game against the Highlanders that you remember. From that day, exactly that morning, we cancelled every single type of rugby uh, that was played in the country. So um, Argentina started a little bit before most of the countries, the lockdown. Um, and then, of course, rugby, we, we took some decisions uh, before as well. So, again, like most of the world, being uh, worried by this situation, but uh, being safe at home and taking care of our families, as probably you guys are there in New Zealand. Yeah, very, very similar here. Well, news broke yesterday that you've made the decision, and I'm sure it's not an easy one to make, that you're, you're challenging Sir Bill Bowman for the role as chairman of World Rugby. What, what's motivated you to take that step forward and, and how are you going to go about that um, in, in, uh, in the near future? Well, I think it's, it's, a, it's a long, it's, it was a long uh, process. Um, I think we all know you guys been been talking and I received some of your programs in the last couple of years and months about how challenging the whole rugby uh, calendar, not only calendar, but the whole the blueprint of rugby was challenging all, all, all around the place. Not only the cost model of, of, of players and, and unions struggling, but also emerging nations trying to find a way. You guys are very close to the to the Pacific, how tough for the players is to represent Fiji and at the same time being playing in Europe and, and so on and many problems towards different kind of approach and dynamics to investment, uh, different ways of looking at things in this modern world that has, has changed since 1995 on a massive speed. We've all been on that part. Uh, Miles, you, John, uh, uh, you, you all been there um, before and, and we've been in this new generation. Um, and I think things didn't change at the pace. I think that the urgency that professional rugby and how uh, a lot of unions were operating. And, and I think uh, during the last year, to be honest, or year and a half, uh, challenging the system from inside because at the end of the day, I, I, I am still the vice chairman, but I couldn't get traction. I, I thought that the establishment was uh, pushing me out a little bit, to be honest. And I, you know, um, uh, I don't have, uh, Jeff, I don't have a lot of uh, bullshit on me. I, I, I am very transparent on how, how things mm -hmm. are done. I don't keep that type of, and the same when I played, uh, you don't, you just go hard at it and try to make. Uh, be transparent and to happen again. We are we've been disciplined enough to go to a, a game, uh, prepare discipline wise, and try to have an outcome. Here, always it was a one more turn. I understand politics, that's fine, but at the end of the day, we couldn't get results. And and if you were looking at the unions, not only New Zealand and you know the Australia situation as well as a very delicate issue, but if you look at USA, you look at Fiji, you look at Uruguay, you look at Georgia. You see that things are, they went a little bit um, downhill, to be honest, and without a perspective of inclusiveness or, or equality, and without making it very boring and, and, and very political, because I, I'm not, I'm trying not to. What I'm saying is the blueprint of rugby had to change. The way of doing things has to change. We cannot carry on working the game as in without having the players side by side with us, telling us, guys, how many weeks you need to rest? How many? You tell us how we can organize the future, taking care of you, for you guys, not, not for you as, as stars or, or, or as, as prima donnas, as telling us how you can get more income, not only yourself, but for the system, for them to invest properly in emergent nations, in, in women's game and in sevens. And 
And that's how I've been pushing the last four years. That's how I think and that's how I feel. Gus, um, obviously I understand your frustrations. I had quite a bit to do with World Rugby a few years ago. And what surprised me the most was that some of the leading nations get two votes and then some of the minor nations only get one vote. So it seems that for you to change anything, um, you know, can you try and change the constitution if you become president? Because I, I remember back, you know, the Fiji don't get a vote really because Ireland can out oh, no. you, you know? It's a good question, John. And the second, the second point again, I don't, I try to be right. We're rugby guys and I, and I have to, and again, I, I've been in this process and, 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 and Mark Robinson always helped me with the process type of, of way. Um, it's, it's about in, in the number, in the second point of, 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 the, of the manifesto that I brought to people to understand it very simple and not to bullshit and not have any, any round the edges parties. We need to have a fair democratic say. Again, you can talk, we can pay lip service to things, but at the end of the day, if people don't have a voice and a vote, you just use them just to be one more guy in the parade to come every four years to perform on a World Cup, bring diversity every four years and then go on, take care of your own things and just come back in four years time and compete. The Fiji situations against Uruguay, they lost that game. is not a coincidence, guys. It's, it's a question of Fiji not having a proper uh, plan and a proper place in a, 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 a tournament week in, week out. It's as simple as that. We all know we are from high performance, uh, uh, we understand how the game is being played. If you don't have a proper investment into that, you cannot perform. That's it. It's simple. And you need, again, you need a vote. You need how to, you need to express how you are and what circumstances you are for them to make decisions easier. I think the interesting thing for me, I read your, I read your article and, and your vision. Uh, we're talking about it down here. So what does a real global game look like for you you win tomorrow, you say, this is what we're going to do. What are sort of two or three things, simple things that the world can understand what a global game might look like? Well, first of all, as I said, you bring into the room the people that are important stakeholders of the game that are the unions and the private equity sector, call it clubs and call it CBC, Silver Lake, call it however you want, because they are part today of the family. So you can, it's a business now. So you need to bring them in and find with the, the nations and the emerging nations and the clubs being in that private equity as well, bring them onto a organized calendar that you can just create more income. It's simple, it's quite simple, but very complex at the same time. Then you have to discuss about where the opportunities are, which are the countries or new markets that you want, if that's USA, if that's, uh, if that's um, Germany or and how you're going to reach there. I, I, you're asking me something that is has been a problem for the last five years. I strongly believe with this crisis, John, that things will make countries be on their knees for, uh, for the first time in the history of the professional game. And we need a solution. And I think, and I, I don't want to be naive here, it's not about being uh, just good for the rest of the game, but also thinking of how you create more income and how to help it. There's no point of having Australia on their knees or New Zealand on their knees or South Africa on their knees or England, Scotland, Wales, if they need that income in November or whenever we play against in the broadcast deal. It's just, it's not rocket science. It's, but at the same time, that's where you need to put, not only to take care of yourself, but also just see how Fiji comes in. Why not the rugby championship now with Fiji and Japan coming in? Why not? I said about Japan in 2017. I'm not saying this because I'm getting political. I raised it in 2017 about Japan, about bringing Fiji, about bringing the USA at some stage or the Americas, if, if, if Six Nations is closed, bring the Americas through the pathway. That's things that you can start talking about. And I can guarantee you Private equity or, 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 or clubs want organization. And that's why I said, first you put what players need. How many weeks? Is eight? Is 12? What is the, 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 the training load? Do you, are you, it's about eight weeks together or do they need 12 weeks during the year or 16? But when, is, when are those weeks are going to hit the, 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 
the income, not only for them, for the whole world. So it's, it's complex, but I think that's leadership and that's bringing to the table on a modern world the stakeholders that need to be there. Not leave them outside, not leave the players outside, not leave the, the, the private equity outside. They are part of our game, an important part of it. That's professionalism, that's a business, and that's how you take, to take care of it. Gus, I want to ask, and there's obviously, you can hear it in your voice and things that you've been there for a wee while, the frustration, and obviously now you want to, you, you're wanting to really lead that front in terms of the stakeholders and things like that. This crisis, though, is also uh, brought upon, you know, it's a lot of pain for a lot of, you know, top tier unions. You know, you talk about Australia, also New Zealand. Have you ever thought about, you know, what that sort of looks like now? Do you prioritise some of those nations first and, and, and making sure we you, you get rugby uh, back up and going in those in, in those top tier nations? Or was it just a, a sense of global, um, you know, e equality right now? Well, it's, that's a very, very interesting point. And, and again, you cannot, and this is, I don't want to confuse, but one thing is the strategy, like every business, one thing is a strategy that where would you like to be in X amount of time, correct? So investment, stakeholders, whatever. On the other side, you have the burden today of the cash flow plus the PNL that will hit you in quarters three and four, correct? And that's something that you are, you, you, we are monitoring like all the time, constantly monitoring with Sansa and the unions because I'm in the ex of Sansa. So we are very, because if Australia falls, then it hits straight to New Zealand first, then it will hit South Africa and Argentina. So we all fall. There's no, it's no individual way. So the first issue, Myers, that you just raised is we need to address the coronavirus and mitigate it towards the day-to-day -day business, to de towards the monthly business and towards the PNL of 2020. That's the first most important thing. It's not about World Rugby be giving handouts because there's no handout possible. World Rugby does not have the 400 million pounds that if any international game is being played this year, the, 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 the game will be hurt. It doesn't happen. We don't, World Rugby doesn't have it. And giving handouts for a cash flow burden, that won't bring you a, a solution to the problems that Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Argentina will have if we don't play any games at all this year. So there's a financial cash flow issue at the beginning that needs to be addressed, there needs to be a, 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 like a, a, a contingency plan for this next month if July window is not being played, and then start looking at how you're going to start the process of stabilizing those income res resources that are the, the, the strong unions for then create the strategic plan. Hopefully I, I don't mix everything up, but that, that's how you will do in any kind of business as everyone, the grocery store Two, two blocks away is doing the same. It's going week by week because we don't really know when business will be as usual as, as, as this virus is hitting us. And we don't know how to, how, how, what's going to happen. Yes, I've got to ask you around the fact that you're instrumental in, on the way Puma Rugby, Argentinian Rugby was brought into Sanzar, was part of what we did establish between South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. How do you see that, that combination of countries now uh, operating in the future and the fact that we know the challenges in front of them in terms of this season but uh, the future of super rugby itself those agreements between Sansa, is that still in the best interest do you believe of argentinian rugby well again uh jeff i think that will come up it's very interesting first of all you need to see how the airline business will carry on that, that's that's a difference how how that will hit the PNL of the competitions. That, that's 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 again a different problem that I couldn't tell you now, and nobody can. Um, and this is a good moment to re reset the cost efficient model, not only of the of the unions but also of the competitions. Maybe you find out that that competition cannot be played because it's not profitable or is or is too much of a of a, of a burden. Probably you'll think you'll be thinking, and that's a New Zealand thing, that the cost-efficient model of five teams is, is is an option. The same as Australia, South Africa, or even in Argentina. Do we really can afford to carry on Super Rugby with the Hawaiians having to pay for the tra trips all around the world? Is that a solution? Maybe we have to fold Hawaiians and 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 look for other alternatives. Everything, and this is where it comes. If you have a parachute that helps you to land 
the next 10 years or five or four, then it's easier to make the day-to-day -day decisions. That's how I think. Yeah, so I think for me, the interesting, the game has been pro since, you know, 1995, 1996. But I feel that our administration hasn't really kept up the same pace with professionalism. I've always felt that our administration has still been a little bit old school. I mean, how, how do you attack that to get some real good strategy around the table to actually start thinking like a business rather than, and this is no disrespect to the people because they give a lot of time and they're good people, sort of old school mentality to this game? Well, again, uh, John, I, I strongly believe in leadership and doing things. I don't, I don't again, I, I'm, I was very clear. My time, I always think for us as, as, as professional sport, people is very precious uh, we we know that we have an amount of time to make a difference to stamp on the on on, on your career and say i made something special i I, feel, I find the same way with with the administration and that's why i'm running now it's not that i love being the chairman of world rugby uh because i will be on the newspapers flying business class or playing golf believe me i don't need that um and 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 that's where i think it comes with hands-on leadership and to work very strong with a business mindset. What is important to change, first of all, to change culture, and you guys know it, and some, somewhere I learned a lot from you guys, is for changing culture, you need to change habits. For changing habits, you have to be disciplined. So that's the only way. And be repetitive, disciplined, and if you fail, you go back again and you do it better. There's no way you can, you can, you can be getting results if you do the same copy paste every single year for the last 20 years it doesn't work i've been there for years and i feel that it has been 20 already um, and it's slow and it's, uh, it's 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 process driven everything for for example i give you a small example i you we all ups, upset as rugby people for the upside lines correct it's very difficult to referee the upside line the game closes I, I work with technology a lot in my businesses and, and with different Piero and different Hawkeye technologies in, in, in soccer and in, in, other, in other part of my, of my business. I, last one year and a half ago, I just said, just as a, guys, why don't we put virtually a line on offside or somebody upside saying 13 is offside, seven offside. It was the same as, as asking to go to the moon and, and conquer Mars exactly, and I said, guys, it's just, it's just something that we released the the the, the man in the middle and the and the guys on the side to just make a better decision, and just look at the game, the breakdown, and it's it's very complicated, and many other things that happen in in one second like this in in in, in the modern rugby, just get the guys on the side the time or somebody upstairs to say offside number ten. And that's simple. Penalty, you'll see that everyone starts being on their place because there's a machine that will tell you every single time you are offside. I, know, I don't know if that will give more dynamic to the game. What I'm sure it will put people on site very quickly. And for you, is that one of the frustrations around the fact that not only is it off the field, is it on the field? Do you think maybe that the product needs to be a little bit better? It needs to be stronger and particularly yeah. at the different levels. How do you manage that? The fact that Test Match Rugby versus the professional level, the club game. Um, uh, for you, uh, who's responsible for actually making those adjustments to make sure that the product is right? First of all, I would put players and coaches, to be honest. I, I, the guys that, again, if I, if I think that I, or somebody from, only from World Rugby, can tell the old black coach or, or Eddie Jones or whoever coaching in the best union that are 24 hours, as you know, looking at every single detail. They, if, they, if they cannot help us, who can? I don't, under, I don't know that anyone outside of those guys and, and, and the players can help us on that professional type. Then it's a very important what you said. It's very important that, that the trustability of that law goes to the guys that play on the park Girls or boys that play on the on the park here, just two blocks away, that just want to have fun. So that's the most important work you have to do. How that offside line that we are really worried about, of that heat that we are worried about, then uh, have some impact. And, and I had a lot of discussions with with with, with some of, of of the Kiwi guys about being soft by the high tackle. Say, guys, 
I understand, but unfortunately, we have to, the, the biggest, the most important thing is the safety of the players. If, if one kid, if one girl or boy down the road sees that the, our top guys are hitting low, they will just take care of themselves. And that will make that parents will like to bring their kids to play rugby. And I see it that way. Then we can discuss about uh, the, the threshold of the card and, and it's a more complex. But at the end of the day, what you want is that kid to be protected by the law. And then in the professional game, how we more, more entertaining game. So that's the balance. But at the end, Jeff, the most important guys that know about that are the top coaches and players. And last two weeks ago, we had the law review group and, and not every coach was there. I will put just the coaches and top players on that um, innovation space to, to just get all the information I can. Yes, I want, to, I want to talk about the gaming world as well. You've obviously taken a good look at, uh, you know, Generation X and things like that. I think you've quoted in the newspapers are saying there hasn't been a, uh, a better game come out than the 1995 Jonah Long Rugby. Can you give us an insight about that, that thought process and, and, um, and, and, and where you're thinking about in terms of, I suppose, revenue and also uh, the reality that, you know, Generation X is a, is a very big market? Well, I, I have kids uh, 19 and 16, and I'm another kid as well coming to Fortnite and League of Legends and, and, and playing every type of game. So... <laughs> I, I, I love it. I've always been in love with that part. That's why, again, my favorite game was uh, Lomu in 1995. I used to play it in the PlayStation 1 every day. Um, and we lost that. I mean, we were very innovative at that stage, and then we lost Cadence. Uh, and it's not about a game. It's, it's about the approach towards young boys and girls, how we make them feel interest on a great game. I think is that, again, we are, if you look at, and I like statistics, if you look at most of the statistics that come back from international rugby, or you, you say it's white male over 50. That, it's a fact. I'm not, I'm not telling you anything wrong. I push, and I give you an example. I spend it with Canon a lot of time with that. You've seen in the World Cup that you've seen like a special viral that went like 360. You remember that, that you showed like a 360 and the try, you had the spring, one of the spring box tries, one of the, of the tries of, uh, of TJ, I think it was there on, on 360. And it was amazing. It took me five meetings to convince World Rugby to push for that technology and put, to push Canon that was doing it for free to make it happen. And I thought that we should have done live in that for kids, live that type of game Canon didn't have it ready, but it would have been amazing to have that kind of technology for the young generations. A World Cup for young generation to have these different technologies, to, to go into the player, look all around. Those are the things uh, some, uh, uh, a kid, a girl or a boy of 15 years old will not stay 80 minutes to watch a game. You know that. We know that. We, we won't. So how do you bring them in that type of, of exercise? It, it's a video game. Video game is very old fashioned, but it's e-gaming. It's talking to EA Sports about getting a good product in uh, and download it with all the main consoles in, 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 in the market. We need to explore it. We haven't. It's, and it's, it's frightening. Yes, I mean, all the things you've talked about today, um, it get, I'm sure gets us excited about the, the possibilities, the opportunities that are in front of you. We're really hopeful that you get plenty of support globally for the opportunity to maybe become the chairman of World Rugby. I can only apologise the number of times on World, uh, on John Lomu Rugby I dropped the ball. That was just, that was one of the things with John. He made me fast, but with bad hands. I, you, I, I, got, yeah. I always pass it to you. You're very yeah, good. Yeah, but, but yeah, I had to get rid of it before contact. That was the name of the game. Jonah was gone. <laughs> <laughs> but look, uh, we wish you all the very best. I know that as former players, all of us here respect uh, so many things that you've uh, uh, contributed to the game and we really do hope you get this opportunity to change and get, uh, I suppose, the chance um, to really shake things up because this um, is such a critical time for the game. Stay safe, take care, and we'd love to catch up with you um, sooner rather than later. Thanks, mate. Thanks, guys, and I wish you all the best. Stay safe. Take care of your families. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm fired up.
this is the sort of thing I like to hear from administrators when they talk about changing the game, JK, Mills, or should I say Miles? I think that you talk about the future of the game. Uh, for me, I like what I'm hearing uh, uh, from Augustine Fisher. The fact that the, the changes here, are looking, he's looking at Mills, the the passion he obviously has for it. But bottom line, he's going to have to bring a lot of people his way if he's going to get some significant change. Oh, and that's it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. He's going to need a lot of support. Um, you know, the, the current regime, you know, they've got a lot of that. They've been there for a number of years. But I, I think you should take comfort from that as well. The fact that he's been a part of that regime. He's you know, the vice chairman as well. He's been there a long time. And you can sense the fact he's got a lot of frustration, uh, you know, in his voice. And he's been there. So he knows what's going on. He knows it hasn't sort of evolved the way he, he perhaps thought it was. And now he's actually, you know, bringing his voice into it. He's going he's gonna to need a lot of support, but I love the way he's gone about it. He's very passionate. Uh, and, and, and I know there's a crisis on at the moment. And perhaps this is now a really good time to, to actually strike the fact that everyone is in this crisis mode um, about, our, about our game. So fantastic. And uh, I hope he goes well. Yeah, same with me, Goldie. I, I mean, I really enjoyed uh, the things he had to say. I mean, that offside line is just a really simple, uh, common sense way to attack it, right? It, if it gets lost in politics, you've got a whole lot of people around the table and it gets lost, whereas really simple, just do that. If he can apply those sort of leadership philosophies to the game, we need it. I mean, you know, I think Sir Bill Beaumont's an amazing man. He's been an amazing, amazing rugby guy. And so are a lot of those guys around that table. But this game needs change. We are at a crossroads and we need some young, innovative leadership. And, um, you know, he'll have his faults like everyone does. But I think he, he understands what our game needs at the moment. And our game needs change. And it should start at the top. Like he kept coming back to leadership. You know, there's going to be a lot of things that have changed outside of COVID and it is a nucleus for change. And so let's change. I was thinking, how do we help them? You know, yep. because the old school are going to be after them. The old school, you know, there'll be all that political, you know, politicking going on, you know, two votes here, two votes there, you know. As a rugby union, the New Zealand rugby union said, no, we should make it even before the next vote. Give Fiji two votes. Give Samoa two votes. Give you know, um, the, 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 you know, Georges and the Uruguays, give them the votes and then let's see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I don't like the fact he even said it himself. He feels as though he has been forced out when you listen to someone like him who is obviously uh, representing not just the Puma rugby, not just the Southern Hemisphere, but representing the game itself and the fact he has been there and done that. He understands the different levels. What I liked about it as well is he wasn't just talking going down one avenue. He was exploring everything. He, he was considered about every part of the game and understanding that, yep, right at the very top, there needs to be adjustments. But what does that mean for the young girl or boy who's playing the game as well, Mills? And for me, it's that well-rounded view and the fact that he seems as though he's well and truly in touch with the generations as well. He understands the history and legacy of the game, but... Right now is the time, isn't it? Right now, given the fact that other teams, other countries, other Northern Hemisphere uh, unions already talking about the fact that they themselves are under financial pressure, that really shouldn't come into it, should it? Is the fact, is this the chance to relaunch the game on a global sense? And is he the right guy to bring it all together? Well, he mentioned re reset. And, you know, I, I, I totally agree with him. Now is probably the, the, the time to be able to reset what happens then. And it's brought everyone else you know, onto the table on a possibly a level playing field because, you know, everyone's in, in crisis mode. You know, he has. He's reached out. He's gone out and thought a lot about, you know, what the what the game actually looks like. He even spoke in, in terms about handouts. I mean, you know, they haven't got the capacity, whereas we're sitting here back here, well, you know, where's all, all this money that they've generated over the years and World Cups and things like that? But he doesn't solely believe in that because they haven't got the funding to be able to do that. So he's thinking, you know, bigger, bigger, and and, and to, to make this game, you know, grow a little bit different. And he's, and he's, he's is targeting some of those markets that you know would perhaps over the years just gone traditionally just think well if we keep it the same you know you know the, the game's safe but he's willing to explore different avenues and he's obviously thought about this for a very very long time let's follow three him and support him three things for you jk oh three things that really appealed to me let the coaches and the players decide what the rules should be and what they look like i'm all over that the second thing is we need a global game and we know that because there's a disparity in finances. 
And the third thing, the third thing that I enjoyed about what he's saying is that private equity is part of our future. We need to stop leaving them outside of the tent, bring them into the tent and talk to them. I mean, when you think about football, it's had private ownership all its professional career. We need to bring these people into the tent and ask them, you know, what they need to stay involved in our game and keep investing. Well, it's a massive opportunity, massive time for world rugby and whether or not Augustine Pichot can find his way to the top of that tree. We can probably only hope as former players, like I say, loved hearing what he had to say today. Well, we've heard from Rob Nickel, we've heard from Sam Kane, of course, talking about the situation between the players and New Zealand Rugby. We spoke to Augustine Pichot. He's having a crack at going for the chairman role at World Rugby. Now we talk about someone who loves to travel, has been around the world, has been around Japan rugby for a long, long time. We went looking for Andy Ellis, and this is what we managed to find. And he didn't get the dress call. We're nice and relaxed here, mate. We're at home. You're dressing up at home. I don't know what's going on there. And I don't know what's going on in the facial hair. You've had my sort of haircut. Mate, run me through it, though, for you. Coming back from Japan, how did it all happened once this pandemic got confirmed and all of a sudden we're at alert level four here in New Zealand? It was all kind of a little bit crazy, um, mate. It, it, um, you know, they just told us, oh, you, you can have a couple of weeks off, go home, go home, guys. And, um, and but you're due back in two weeks. Uh, and then we got home and then, you know, a couple of days before we were due to fly back, kind of everything just got sort of cancelled really quickly. And so, you know, we were, we were midway through our season. Um, everyone really enjoying what they're doing and, and, and literally just within the space of two weeks, everything got cancelled, I suppose a little bit like Super Rugby and and now we're just sort of at home now twiddling our thumbs a little bit waiting to hear kind of what happens next. Andy, um, one of the biggest, most amazing experiences of my life was after the tsunami, I got a phone call from the CEO saying, as a foreigner, you need to come back now. And I remember being on a plane from Zurich back to Tokyo with two people on it. Most of the eerie moment of my life. I got back to Tokyo and it was like blacked out. It was amazing times. But I mean, how hard is it dealing with the Japanese companies now? Because they do think differently. If they said to you, you don't come back, you don't get paid. Is there any weird Japanese stuff going on in your world at the moment? Yeah, well, it is so different, isn't it? Um, rugby in Japan with the companies actually owning, um, you know, the teams and the players. So, um, you know, there was a little bit of that in some, in some clubs. Um, we, we were really fortunate the New Zealand Rugby Players Association jumped on board early. Um, and Rob Nickel and, and Fiona did a fantastic job. They they really looked after us while we were in Japan, created a, a WhatsApp group chat with a couple of key sort of leaders, guys from, from each of the different clubs. Um, so there was really open communication about what was going on. Some companies were saying, no, you can't leave, guys. Some were saying, yes, you can. Um, but we were just trying to get really aligned. Um, and, and Rob did a great job too. You know, he contacted um, New Zealand Rugby and Japan Rugby and the Japan Rugby Players Association as well. And he got them all, um, it, you know, just didn't put pressure on, but just made it really clear that player welfare needs to come first here, need to look after our, 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 our guys and their families. And ultimately that put, put enough sort of pressure on for, for a lot of the clubs to kind of uh, let, let the guys go home. You know, we're really lucky at our club. We, we had Wayne Smith as our director of rugby and, and Bills as well. So we had good leadership there and our, our clubs kind of forward thinking. So they had let us go by that stage, but there were a lot of guys at a lot of the other clubs that were really struggling for some clarity around, you know, if they were allowed to go home or not. Real momentum after the, the Rugby World Cup and particularly with the way, you know, Japan, the Japanese team went and the season looked like it was going to be like that too. There was lots of crowd numbers and things like that in terms of the top league. And then it sort of hits this sort of unknown part. Did you feel, you know, given everything that's gone on now that perhaps we might lose a bit, bit of that momentum once, you know, we eventually hopefully come out of this um, this crisis? Yeah, maybe, mate. It was, it was it's crazy really because, you know, I've been playing for five, this was my sixth season in Japan. And, mate, we started out the season this year and there was sellout um crowds 35 40 thousand at every game and we, you know we'd, we'd only played in front of five thousand before then so it was this amazing um atmosphere and with with the japanese too jk you know you know that they were all there like two hours before the game so so when you arrived on the bus the, the whole stadium was sold out you know and it was that was week after week so there was this really good energy real excitement um it was on you know a lot, a lot of the tv shows and it was all, all rugby there's good energy around it so 
the timing isn't great, and I think probably it will it will play a bit of an impact, um, you know, on those on those crowd numbers and that excitement post Rugby World Cup. But you know, hopefully at the same time we can can kick things out off um, at the start of the next season, try and try and get some good energy back again. No one knows where it's going to be, Andy, uh, in terms of the, the competition going forward in Japan. So if you don't know that, and so many of our Kiwi players have returned back to New Zealand, is there an opportunity for them to maybe get back and, and play a few games provincially if you're not heading back to Japan in six uh, for six months? Do you think there's an appetite from you guys who have come back, particularly yourself? There'll be teams out looking for an experienced, valuable half-pace halfback. Uh, experience goes a long way. Uh, do you reckon they could be looking for the likes of you? And do you think you're open to to maybe doing that? Are other players open to it? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you you look at the whole situation that's kind of unfolded, um, you know, there's going to be internal rugby, isn't there? There's not going to be a lot of international travel. And I think, oh, that's a real exciting thing for New Zealand rugby. You're going to have uh, All Blacks potentially playing in a domestic competition who are going to need rugby. You're going to have a lot of uh, returning guys who are back in New Zealand who are going to want to keep playing rugby as well. Um, and and it's, uh, there's world-class um, New Zealand rugby players, you know, throughout that are, that are sort of just sitting in their in their homes, sort of twiddling their thumbs at the moment. So I'd love to see that a really strong domestic New Zealand rugby competition kicks off. People are hungry to watch rugby now at the moment as well. So I couldn't see why there wouldn't be a heap of guys that would that would be keen to play and, and the competition be of a really high standard. And how, how cool is that, you know, too, back, back in your local province, um, you're playing for your local cities, your regions. Um, that's, that's pretty cool for New Zealand rugby. A little bit of grassroots again. Andy, like the, we've just spoken to Augustine Pichot. He's talking about a global game. I mean, you've had six years in Japan. You know our game incredibly well. The Sunwolves hasn't quite worked. You know, do your players over there talk about what it might look like coming out of this for the Japanese to be in a global game and a global club game? I mean... Have you discussed what that might look like? Not, not really, JK. But you, you know that in Japan, rugby is a, a massive growing sport. There's, there's really big junior numbers playing. Um, it, the support at the start of this season too, with all our sellout crowds. Um, you know, and it wasn't just uh, us. It was every, it was every game was was really popular. A lot of merchandise sold. So, so there's real um, popularity in Japan rugby at the moment. Um, so, so I think ultimately, at some stage, it will become global for Japan. They're talking about all sorts of different tournaments within Japan and through Asia at the moment as well. Nothing set in, set in stone yet, mate. But um, I think ultimately at some point it, it will become a little bit more global for Japan. And and they're now good enough to, you know, they, they can compete. You see the way, see the, what they did at, at the World Cup. You know, they're, they're good enough to compete on the world stage and bring a bit of spark to the whole thing. And, and yeah, on, on a personal note, then you, you probably have to, rejig your sort of thought process now. I mean, there was whispers last year that you'd pr- this could possibly be your last year, but just hearing in your voice, you sound pretty excited by the fact that, uh, you know, there's crowds there. So I don't know, mate. In, in some ways, this is a nice way to kind of be forced to stop and sit down and, and reassess, you know, I'll give myself a good three or four months now to, to figure out what's next. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure. You know, I was really enjoying this, the, this, this season and then I was going to make a call after that. So I don't know, mate. I still love, I still love competing. Um, and so we'll just see, mate. I've got a young family too, you know, they're cracking into school back home and stuff too. So I'll just, I'll make a good call. But the nice thing is I'm almost forced to sit still for, for three or four months now and, and make a good call when the time's right. Do you think uh, as players though, uh, you're looking at the global game, you're talking, and JK's talking about it, is the fact that where the game is going right now, do you see the players, do you see the, uh, the players, the coaches, the countries themselves being able to come together and, and, and steer rugby in a, down a different path? Do you think it, believe it needs to go down a different path for the growth of the game? Yeah, I think, I think so. And we've kind of been discussing different options for a couple of years now, haven't we? And it's going to going to have to become more global at some stage. Um, this might just be the, the catalyst for that. You know, you can, you can stop and decide how to, to really promote hard. You know, how, how great would it be? And, there, and there's time in the calendar now to, to kind of fit these games in, you know. Northern, Hem- Northern Hemisphere versus Southern Hemisphere games, and um, you know even internally, you know, you know South versus North again. You know all these games that we haven't been able to watch for a long time now. You just kind of recreate the wheel a little bit, I suppose. You know, and, and come up with some cool ideas. And it sounds like um, World Rugby are, are getting a fresh new perspective in there too. So, you know, who, who knows how how the next sort of few months are going to play out? But I'd love to see it 
in a, in a far more global context. There's no doubt for me, mate. Uh, you can take the jacket off now. You can go back to doing what you're doing at home. Relax, chill out. I mean, you're overdressed to show. You've, you've, you've dressed us up. But, mate, it's it's great to get a different perspective. Um, it's always great to have you on the show. We've had you on build-ups before. Looking forward to seeing you back in front of the television again, maybe. I'm sure there's a role for you there if you're thinking post your rugby career. But, uh, mate, stay safe. Look after your family and uh, have a shave, will you? Mate, Thanks, yeah. okay. And, um, uh, yeah, I know I look, I look good on top, but, mate, I, I won't show you what's down below. <laughs> enough said enough said enough said and that's where we're going to end you thanks mate talk to you soon well we've certainly heard from so many people today Andy Ellis coming out of Japan Rob Nichols Sam Kane Augustine Pichot who's the vice chairman right now will he be the chairman or will he be on the outer we'll bring back Bernadine a lot to sort of absorb and take in but it just shows there is so much activity in the game Look, I'm looking forward to the next seven days before we come back and discuss what I'm sure is going to be some some fantastic and amazing, I suppose, progressions of rugby as we go forward. Absolutely, and I think um, Pisho is the the bravest man in rugby. He is taking it on at his most fragile, and he's got a challenge ahead. And and one would hope someone with his passion would get a chance to uh, evolve the game and make it something great. Because I think, without doubt. It's going to change. We just hope it's going to go in that right direction, not only for the players, but for the fans. We just want some rugby. Yeah, we want some rugby. Uh, 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 in a week's time, they're talking about possibilities, Bernie. Uh, I mean, for you, uh, do you do you need some space right now? Are the runs doing the job? <laughs> do I need some space? You need some a trip space? to the supermarket. I bumped into a friend at, at a safe distance, I might add, in the, in the car park. I felt on the way home like I'd been to a three-day weekend in Sydney. I felt like I'd had some time out. It was great. I am ready for this to be over like everybody else, but we've just got to – we're on the home straight now. We've just got to keep doing the same thing. It's gonna, But in some ways, though, Mills, as things may be, as they ease off, and we're going to take our leadership from our, from our government and from our health officials, and, you know, certainly every one o'clock every, every day I, I tune in and I see what, how we're going, what are the numbers, what's the information they're telling us. I, went, I actually went to the supermarket for the first time uh, on the weekend, and it, it was almost like my, I'd, I'd noticed myself behaving differently and looking at things differently. It's going to take a long time to get back to normal, right? Oh, you're certainly right. And you, when you talk about that one o'clock, I mean, that's definitely on the record um, button on your, de on your decoder at, at the moment because that's what you want to be seeing every day. But what I've loved about this also is, I mean, what a difference a week can make, but also the, the clarity that we've had in terms of where the state of the game was before this happened, but also, you know, where things are, are, are heading and, and some of the thoughts of people that are, that are right in, in, in amongst it. So, you know, has it come at a, at, a, at a good time? I know it's a big crisis. What has actually created? Created is the fact that our game perhaps was heading, you know, to a state where you know not everyone was liking it and that the revenues from it was um, was wasn't quite right. Now it's given us a whole opportunity to get that clarity from some of the big, big, big guns uh, in world rugby, which I'm, I'm absolutely loving. So I'm looking forward to the next seven days and seeing what comes out of that. As I talk to people, they've enjoyed the benefit of time. All of a sudden, they've had time to do some things, whether it be at home, catch up with people, JK, uh, to get out and exercise more, and maybe form some habits when we do get out of level four, level three, level two, that are going to help people in their everyday life if we get some normality back. But today was a, a very special day for you, uh, the, the launch of, of Mentimia, and, and, and run us through um, the time and effort and, and what it uh, gives New Zealanders an opportunity to be a part of it and help themselves to. Yeah, look, it's uh, been an amazing few weeks for me personally. Uh, I created a company three years ago with my business partner, Adam Clark. And what we wanted to do was create a mental health tool for everybody every day. So you can get a benefit of this tool um, on a daily basis. So we've developed the app and, and sort of three weeks ago when we realized that uh, COVID was coming, we decided to try and give it to the whole of New Zealand during this time for free. Um, I rang a couple of my mates, uh, David McLean at, at Westpac Bank, and he said, go for it, J JK, I'm into it, all over it, I'm going to help you. Um, Steve Yukovic from Kiwi Bank was the same. Uh, I rang Robin Shearer from the Ministry of, of Health. And so with that combination of people helping, we've uh, launched it this morning, and it's free to everyone. You can go on to the App Store, download it, and really, it's just like having a mental health coach in your pocket. So 
you can learn about COVID, you can learn about things you can do just on a daily basis to stay a, to stay a little bit better. So uh, exciting times and really out of this whole uh, COVID thing, we're hoping that people will realise that their mental health needs to be, you know, front of mind every single day for us to stay well. And like you said, Goldie, you know, we're all going to things do things differently and and hopefully mental wellness, mental fitness, mental health, whatever you want to call it, uh, it's going to be a big part of people's lives in the future and hopefully Mental Mia can help. All well right, done, team. JK. Absolutely. That's outstanding. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. We look forward to joining you in seven days' time to give you everything you need to know about the game of rugby, but also maybe a little bit of hope and optimism, which we're starting to see for the future. Take care, and we'll see you next Tuesday night.